please rise. The sermon is based on the text from Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Heavenly Father, help us to understand your word tonight. May it grow in our hearts that we may prepare our hearts for the gift of your Savior that you will give us at the end of this Christmas season. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Do you know the name William Dix? There's actually probably one person in this congregation that probably knows something about it, and that would be our organist. It's probably not familiar to you unless you know something about hymnology. William Dix, you see, was born in Bristol, England in 1837. And think of that, that's 25 years before our Civil War. Dix was fond of reminding people that he was, <clears throat> this was the same year that Samuel Morris invented the telegraph and Queen Victoria came to the throne in the British Empire. He was the son of a surgeon in Bristol, England, but after receiving his basic schooling in Bristol, he moved to Glasgow, Scotland. Dick spent most of his life in Glasgow working as a marine insurance manager, a job he did not find very exciting. Dix is of interest to us because he was a poet, particularly a religious poet. He wrote four volumes of religious poetry. He penned several metrical translations of Greek and Abyssinian Ab poetry. He was the author of many Christmas and Easter carols. He even wrote a special volume of hymns and carols for children. Several of his songs are in our hymnal, songs which you, should, you are familiar with, as with gladness, men of old, alleluia, sing to Jesus, and come unto me ye weary. Dix also wrote the song from which the theme of our midweek ad ad Advent service is taken. What child is this? Dix once told somebody, my hymns generally run off the end of my pen and I rarely tinker with or alter them once I've written them. If you've ever tried to write, write poetry even as an ex exercise in a class at school, you probably envy Dix with that ability. Most of us labor a great deal when we write poetry. First we struggle with our basic idea, then we decide what rhyme and rhythm to use, and finally we write and rewrite our verses. It would be great if we all, had to do, all we had to do was take out our pen and words would come running off the end of the way they did for Dix. How blessed we are that Dix's pen was gushing with words. Dix, Dix set forth some of the most glorious truths in scripture in the most meaningful words and melody. We'll see that in our next three weekend, <clears throat> week, midweek Advent services as we follow the theme, what child is this? As we look at the text on which Dix based that carol, we'll review and reaffirm the great truths of Christmas, truths that distinguish our Lutheran celebration from that of the world. We, give, we begin by using Isaiah's words to, an, to answer Dick's questions. What child is this? We will see that he had an earthly birth in the town of Bethlehem and that his heavenly origin was from eternity. How much do you know about the prophet Micah? If you're like the average Christian, you probably don't know that much about him. You may not know where he lived or what the main thrust of his message was. You may be able to quote words, the words of our text, because this text is often one of the recitations in children's Christmas Eve services. The prophet Micah ministered about the same time as the great prophet Isaiah. They both lived 725 years before Jesus' coming. Micah, like Isaiah, carried out his ministry in Judah, the southern kingdom of his, <clears throat> at the time the Assyrians at, at the time that the Assyrians threatened and finally captured Israel, the northern kingdom. 
Micah warned the people of Judah that they were going to come under God's judgment as Israel had. That's what he preached in the first two chapters of his book. In chapters three to five, the tone of his book changes. Micah looks ahead to the messianic, messianic kingdom, the rule of mercy and the grace the promised savior would establish in heaven. Then in the last two chapters of this book, Micah elaborates on the comforting truth that there is no God like our God. He says, <clears throat> he says God shepherds his people in love and pardons all of their sins, even though they do not deserve it. But nothing the Lord says through Micah is more than comforting than the simple truth which you probably know by heart. Did you notice whom the Lord addresses in our, in our text? It's the town he calls Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrata, which we simply know as Bethlehem. There's a reason the Lord uses two, two names for this town, which, which is about five miles south of Jerusalem. For you see, there were two Bethlehems in Palestine. This one and one in the north, 10 to 12 miles southeast of Mark, Mount Carmel. Bethlehem means house of bread. And it got its name because of the grain growing areas to, in Judah. To make sure that people knew he was talking about the southern Bethlehem, the Lord calls it Bethlehem Ephrata. Ephrata means fruitful or abundant and refers to all the grains growing there. Notice how the Lord describes Bethlehem. He says, you are little among the thousands of Judah Bethlehem isn't a very important town. It's a little village, a proverbial wide spot in the road. We tend to romanticize Bethlehem because this is where Jesus was born. But in Micah's day, and even when Jesus was born there, Bethlehem was sort of a hick town. It wasn't among the towns in the Southern Kingdom that had a thousand people or more. The only, <clears throat> the only claim to fame was that in this hometown of Israel, this was the hometown of Israel's greatest king. David was born in Bethlehem. And yet that unlikely place, that humble little village is where God will do something truly remarkable, will be truly miraculous as he says there. The Lord here promises Bethlehem as, a, as insignificant as it is, out of you will come to, to me the one who is to be ruler of Israel. Focus, if you will, on what the Lord says about the one who will be born in the unlikely town of Bethlehem. The Lord says, he shall come forth to me. Why, why will God the Father The, the one the Lord is talking about will carry out God's saving work. That's why he said to me. This is one of, <clears throat> this is this whole life process. The reason he will be born in Bethlehem. He will be the ruler of Israel, the heavenly Israel, and not an earthly or political ruler. He won't come to free the northern kingdom from the Assyrians, for example, or to save the southern kingdom from the Babylonians either. Rather, he will come out, come to carry God's saving purpose. Isn't this like God? That he does the most amazing things in the most unlikely way? To see how true that, true that is, imagine that you were told to choose where the savior of the world were to come to earth. Would you have chosen Bethlehem? Hicksville? Nothing but a wide spot in the road? We can, we can think of far more impressive places where the Savior could have been born. Alexandria in Egypt, for instance, was a thriving Egyptian town. Athens in Greece, or Rome, the mightiest city in the entire Western world. To us, those would have seemed to have been better choices. But Bethlehem? A dinky, dusty, dull Bethlehem? We would have chosen we would not have chosen that crossroad village, but God did. 
You see, the merchants there probably came from Israel, from Jerusalem, to buy grain, figured it was a long time, and they had to stay overnight in the inn, and they couldn't wait to get out of Bethlehem. But that was their job. This shows us that the effective power of the plan of our salvation rests solely with God and God alone, not with us. God does things backwards in, in the sense that it's not the way we would have done it. By doing that, he shows everything about our salvation from beginning to end, including where the Savior would be born, depends on his mighty working, not our futile efforts. As Paul reminds us in Corinthians, God chooses the foolish things of the world and the weak things and the base things and the things that are, that are so despised by the world to carry out his saving purpose. And why? So no flesh should glory in his presence, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. This makes it clear that the excellence of the power is always with God, not us. But there's another reason God chose the unlikely place. When the Savior came, one of the tests for determining that he was the promised one was that he came from Bethlehem. There weren't a lot of Jewish boys born in Bethlehem every year. The town wasn't among the thousands of Judah. Remember, those towns with a thousand people or more were described as such. Demographers have figured out that there would only have been five or six boys born in Jerusalem or in Bethlehem per year. How different from Rome with a million people. There would have been thousands of boys born there each year by having the Savior born in Bethlehem. God made it much easier for the people to recognize the one who fulfilled the prophecy in Micah along with the 455 other Old Testament predictions of Christ. How precious and comforting this prophecy is. It helps us to see our salvation depends entirely on God's working. And it assures us that Jesus, who was born in that crossroad town, that the, <clears throat> is the one and only we are to trust because God sent him to carry out his plan for salvation. But there's another important truth that the Lord reveals here. Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Do you understand what the Lord is saying here? These words are familiar because they usually hear them at Christmas, as we mentioned. They're often used in children's Christmas services. But do we understand what the Lord is telling us about his promised one? The first part is easy to understand. The Lord says Bethlehem will be the birthplace of the one who is to be ruler in Israel. Bethlehem has already been the place where the one of Israel's rulers was born, the great King David. But that was 250 years prior. Now the Lord looks to the, in the other direction, into the future, and says that another ruler will come out of Bethlehem, great David's greater son. In other words, this prophecy is, is the coming of Jesus, the ruler of all. That we understand. But do we understand the second part of this verse? The Lord says about the ruler who will be born in Bethlehem, his, going, his goings forth have been from of old. That's not an expression we commonly use. But, what, but does it mean, <clears throat> what does it mean that the rulers going forth have been from of old? The expression going forth refers to the origin of our savior the time he began or didn't begin. The Lord says the Savior King will have his earthly beginning when he is born in Bethlehem, but he will also have been from of old. This phrase can mean from a long time in the past, but it can also mean eternity, from eternity. And that's how our Lord uses it here. 
he shows that when <clears throat> he adds the parallel expression from everlasting, the one who will have his earthly origin in Bethlehem has existed from everlasting. This is hard to grasp, isn't it? How can anyone be from of old, from everlasting, without a beginning? You see, you and I are time bound. We all have a beginning and we'll all have an end. Our going forth doesn't stretch back very far even if we've reached the seventh or eighth decade of our lives. It certainly isn't from everlasting, so it's difficult for us who live by clocks and calendars to grasp someone existing from eternity with no beginning, and no end. But that's where our Savior's origin is, in eternity. For you see, the one who was born in Bethlehem on a certain day about 4, 4 BC actually existed in eternity, without a birthday, without a beginning. He is true God. He always was, just as the Father and the Holy Spirit always were. Although he came down to earth in the days of Julius Caesar, he existed forever prior to that birth. I like the way Max Licato puts it in his book, When God Came Near. Okay, In one chapter, Licato looks at the birth and early childhood of Jesus the way he imagines Jesus' mother Mary would have. He expresses some of the questions Mary must have thought as she was watching her little five-year-old grow up. She knew that his going forth from of old from everlasting because she had been conceived by the Holy Spirit. In the chapter entitled 25 Questions for Mary, Lucata asks, Mary, did you ever feel awkward teaching Jesus about how he created the world? Did you ever try to count the stars with him and fail? When Jesus saw a rainbow, did he ever mention the flood and that he and his heavenly father had created it? What did, did you ever catch Jesus looking at the flesh on his arm while holding a clod of dirt? Did the thought ever occur to you that the God to whom you were praying every night was asleep under your own roof in the other room? Did you ever see Jesus with a distant look on his face as if he were listening to someone that you couldn't hear? And did you ever think, that's God eating my soup? These are the blessed truths the Lord sets before us in part of our text. The one who was born as a humble baby 2,000 years ago is our glorious God-man who has existed from everlasting. He who is so great that the universe cannot contain him became an embryo in the womb of a virgin. The mighty one who upholds all things by his word of mouth became dependent on a young girl to nourish him and to raise him. The creator of all life became one of those created things. And he who ruled in indescribably glory in heaven before creation came to earth in an unbelievable humility. Michael reminds us that, we, that as we look at the ch little child in Bethlehem, we shouldn't only think of how much he gave up or how far he came down. In other words, we don't want to see Jesus in the hum humility of his humanity. We want to keep in mind that where he came from and who he is, true God, whose origin from ever, is, ever from, is from everlasting. We want to lift the veil of Jesus' humanity and catch a glimpse of his divinity. Remember how we say in the, in the creeds, eternally begotten, not made. For if we don't see Jesus' glory as true God this season, we're not really celebrating Christmas. 
Christmas just isn't a nice story about a lowly baby being born in quaint little town of Bethlehem. Christmas is the story of God's true, truly coming near for our salvation. The story of one who existed from eternity, stepping into our world and living among us for a time that he might serve us as our savior. So let us be, let that be the center of your Christmas celebration that you focus on the question, what child is this? And answer with William Dix, the hymn writer, this, this is Christ the Lord, whom all the hosts of heaven adored. Recognize anew that the babe in Bethlehem is our glorious God from everlasting. Then give him the honor and praise that he is due. Amen.